Welcome to the Group Dentistry Now Show, the voice of the DSO industry. Kim Larson and Bill Newman talk to industry leaders about their challenges, successes, and the future of group dentistry. Visit groupdentistrynow.com for more DSO analysis, news, and events. Looking for a job or have a job to fill? Visit joindso.com. We hope you enjoy today's show. Hi, I'd like to welcome everyone to the Group Dentistry Now show. I'm Bill Newman, and you know, as always, thank you everybody for listening in today, whether it's on Spotify, Apple, Google, or any of the other audio platforms that we're on. Uh, we, without a great audience like you, we wouldn't have a show. And of course, without great guests, you wouldn't be listening. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to a really exciting guest that we have uh, on the show today, Dr. Greg White, who is the president and CEO of Pepper Point Partnerships. Thanks, thanks, Greg, for being here today. It's my pleasure, Bill. Thank you. Yeah, this is this is going to be an exciting conversation. I, I love to talk about you know some of the interesting things that are really going on in the group practice in the DSO space. Um, but you've got a really um, beyond being a, an accomplished orthodontist that has a alternative DSO platform, you have done a lot of entrepreneurial things outside of the dental industry. So if you wouldn't mind talking a little bit about that, uh, maybe putting you on the spot here, but uh, you've just done so many cool things. It's really neat to just talk about some of those things outside of the dental industry. Yeah, well, I appreciate that, Bill. Uh, yeah, I guess um, you know, early on in my orthodontic career, I had a tendency to wander outside of that a little bit and kind of explore some other things. You know, when you're young, you uh, tend to do that. You have the uh, energy and passion for it, then it's a great little outlet. So uh, my first foray into uh, uh, business outside of uh, orthodontics was probably three to four years into my career. Uh, I was, uh, I guess, about 31, 32, and uh, got into the restaurant business um, as a franchisee to begin with. And then over a period of several years, ended up uh, uh, owning 17 uh, restaurants, 10 of which were franchises. Uh, and uh, the other seven uh, were three different concepts that I came up with and um, uh, put those into place. And so that was real interesting. And it was a great little pathway because, you know, in dentistry, it's um, uh, quite easy to uh, have a profitable business, even though it may not be a great business, it can still be profitable because the margins are so good, uh, or certainly were back then. But when you're in a restaurant business where you're dealing with um, single digit margins, you really have to hone your skills on being able to manage uh, things such as food and labor and paper costs and that sort of thing. So uh, that was a uh, really a great exercise for me to go through over about a 23 year period that I owned those restaurants. Uh, to really hone those skills. And then uh, somewhere along the way, um, one of my, my original orthodontic partner, his wife um, was diagnosed with breast cancer and uh, uh, he created a, um, uh, a silicone foam uh, for um, use as, and, and he patented it uh, as a use for a prosthetic uh, for uh, women who had undergone mastectomy. And uh, so he asked me if I could help him turn that into a company. So we, uh, we did that and um, um, raised enough money to be able to launch it. And uh, then we ended up selling that three to four years later to a company out of Ireland. And still today, that um, product remains the number one uh, seller of custom breast prosthesis worldwide. And uh, so anyway, a few things like that I've done along the way that really uh, actually helped me uh, as I was um, uh, beginning to look at an alternative DSO that ultimately became Pepper Point. Really, really cool. And, and you know, your, your point is well taken uh, on, the, on the restaurant side of things uh, as far as the margins and um, really kind of creating a, you know, a, a customer experience that I think um, a lot of DSOs are, are doing some, you know, with more success than others, but you, you talked a little bit about the high margins in dentistry and, and being able to, you know, even without having maybe the best business plan out there, still do pretty well for yourself. Certainly not the case in, in retail and, and in the restaurant business. So kind of in, interesting how that, I'm sure that's really helped you with Pepper Point. A little bit of background on Greg. 
on the on the dental side of things now. So obviously he he's a DMD orthodontist. Um, was one of the founding partners of White Greer and Maggard Orthodontics, which was formed back in 1991 and is currently one of the largest privately owned orthodontic group practices in the country. Greg, you practiced orthodontics for a little more than 25 years, right? Yeah, I practiced full time for 28 years. And then the last two, um, I had to pull out of the clinic in order to devote uh, my full time to the management of uh, Pepper Point. So let's talk about uh, Pepper Point partnerships. Uh, talk a little bit about what led to its formation back in 2017. Yeah, so Pepper Point, uh, Bill, was really formed um, as a company to execute a business model uh, that really was aimed at minimizing the disruptions uh, that were facing the, the uh, orthodontist and the pediatric dentist uh, within a defined geographic area. And um, uh, the whole idea was that if we could uh, uh, self-consolidate uh, rather than um, each individual practice selling their practices piecemeal uh, to um, um, private equity backed DSOs that we could keep the ownership uh, in the offices, uh, have the owners own their own D have the, have the practitioners own their own DSO and uh, therefore be able to negotiate the, uh, uh, with third party payers, be able to negotiate with suppliers, basically have the same advantages that the uh, DSO backed practices have, but without giving up what we consider the heart and soul of the practice, which is the doctor ownership. It's that heart and soul that causes that uh, doctor to stay committed, to take those calls at all hours of the night, uh, to invest in the community, to become a community leader, uh, and to stay for 25 and 30 years as a practitioner, uh, uh, really committing themselves to the patients as well. So that's what we were trying to preserve is what we had created and our legacy. And then along with that, creating a uh, pathway to ownership for the new doctors so that we could reconstitute the old uh, transition model that has largely died as a result of um, the high student loan debt that kids get out of school with, coupled with um, the uh, inability to purchase practices that are for sale because of the inability to obtain uh, loans uh, due to the ever-increasing restrictions from lenders, and then also uh, the high price of those practices as a result of the valuation changes uh, with PE entering the dental field. Yeah, a lot, a lot of different variables make it really um, almost uh, insurmountable for a uh, a young dentist to try and acquire a practice, whether it's the student debt or the valuations to your point that uh, we're a PE or, or a strategic partner, a large DSO can come in and, and offer quite a bit more money uh, for a practice than a, than a solo practitioner would be able to, to afford. Exactly. But a bit, you know, beyond that, so, so it makes a lot of sense. You've got this alternative DSO model out there. Um, Tell me a little bit about, about the why behind it. I mean, you gave, gave me some reasons. I mean, did you go out into the market? Were you talking to, to docs in, in your community that said, hey, um, you know, this sounded like a great idea? How did, you, how did you bet the model? Well, the first thing that I did is I had to explore what was out there. So at that time, Bill, Wager Magger consisted of 20 orthodontic-only locations, uh, all within a 60-mile radius of Lexington, Kentucky. I was the managing partner of that uh, practice, and um, uh, as a result of that, I had a responsibility to my partners in order to start looking uh, for an exit strategy. What does it look like? Um, you know, the practice had had grown to a point where it was going to be very difficult for any individual, any group of individuals to purchase it because of the things I just laid out. Uh, the valuation changes. So I had to do what was right by my partners from a financial standpoint, but I also felt a moral obligation to do what was right for the patients. So uh, I started exploring the various DSO options out there. And despite cultural differences, they all really came down to the same thing. And that was uh, that they were going to give us a, a big check. They were going to greatly reduce our incomes and they were going to give us some stock. And then we were going to need to say really nice things about what we had done and build a strong case for why we made that decision, because we need to say positive things to other practitioners so that they would do the same thing so that my stock would rise. 
so that I could sell it three to five years later when that private equity company rolled it up to a larger tier PE company that then would become the owner of the DSO. But ultimately, uh, they were, um, uh, I was going to take a big check and uh, my income was going to decrease significantly. And the terms um, and the timing of my exit from, uh, from dentistry was largely um, going away. Uh, I was going to be out of my hands, rather. So I started looking at that and I said, well, I don't know that that's what most um, orthodontist, pediatric dentists, or general dentist, from that stand, for, you know, for that matter, really want. Are, are they looking at the age of 45 or 50 to go ahead and exit within the next three years? Do they really want to take this big income hit? Do they need this big check? And uh, I could understand it if it was uh, somebody who was fairly new out of school that had a nice practice but had this um, unbearable debt load that was weighing on their minds and they wanted to get out from under it. Uh, good alternative for them uh, to go with a traditional DSO or the really old and tired person that just can't do this anymore. I just want out tomorrow. <clears throat> but that really uh, wasn't 80 percent of the folks that I talked to. What they really wanted uh, was protection from the disruptions. They wanted uh, to stop this death by a thousand paper cuts uh, from uh, uh, reimbursements being uh, lower, from uh, rising cost of technology, equipment, uh, supplies, just getting eaten away a little bit at a time. So uh, I went to my, uh, my orthodontic partners and I went to some of the other orthodontists in the community and some of the other pediatric dentists. And I said, uh, do you really need a big chunk of money right now? And they said, no, I just really want these protections. I said, okay, well, why don't we create a model whereby um, you, um, we don't get any money up front. Our income doesn't go down, but rather goes up because of the negotiation with the third party payers, uh, decreased supply cost. Uh, we can then purchase other practices for people who want to sell uh, out around the area. And then as um, uh, we have an exit strategy built in so that we sell back to the company. And then what we sell is a pathway to ownership for the associate doctors that work for us. But since we're doing this under the formation and under the structure of our own DSO, when we retire, we don't have to sell our ownership in our DSO. We can keep that, and that becomes our passive income in retirement. And that really answered an age-old question that most every dentist has asked at some point in their career, how can I maintain my lifestyle once I retire? And this answered that question. So it provided all of those things, uh, the protection, the increased income, uh, the exit, the legacy extension, and the passive income in retirement. Really interesting there. So uh let me make sure i understand this and the audience understands it right so uh and from a transition standpoint uh a dentist that's looking to to retire would be able to sell out there or bring bring in an associate or somebody new to that practice to kind of sell that to this new dentist that pra at the practice level but still retain equity in the, the top co in the dso yeah, so sort of uh, what they're actually doing is selling their interest in the overall group, because on <clears throat> when we all came in and, and merged um, back in uh, August of 2019, and that was 50 locations all on the same day, 20 different practices, we all conveyed our ownership into that group practice. And in return for conveying our ownership into that practice, we all received uh, a percentage ownership in the DSO and in the group practice, um, which the stock in that tied us all back to our original income when we were coming in. That income has continued to increase year over year over the last two years because of those negotiations that I mentioned, uh, along with just purchasing other practices in the area that did not take part in this initial uh, consolidation. Uh, when an individual decide, a partner decides they want to retire, they sell their ownership not to an individual coming in, but rather back to the company. That company, while it has maybe 40 different partner docs, it also has 15 or 20 associate doctors. The next associate doctor in line, as determined by that ownership group of doctors, is the one that gets the opportunity to purchase that stock, thereby um, take, uh, benefiting from the retained earnings in the practice. Uh, the person that replaces them in their office uh, becomes an associate doctor that then gets in line for that pathway to ownership as well. So who is receiving that retiring doctor's ownership is not necessarily going to be the individual that replaces them 
in that office, but rather the next associate doctor uh, in line for uh, pathway to ownership. Okay, great. Yeah, that, that clears things up. That, uh, that makes, makes a lot of sense. Um, quick question for you here. I mean, obviously, a, a pretty, um, pretty new model. I mean, coming up with this idea uh, seems really unique in the space. So was there any concern that this, this might not work? Well, oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, whenever you're doing something different, um, uh, you always are concerned that it's not going to work. Uh, so you have to build uh, protections within the model to make sure that each of the practitioners coming in are making one commitment and they live up to that commitment. And that is that I'll continue to work at the same rate that I am right now. And if I do that, I know that my income is going to come up. So you have to build protections in to make sure uh, that you don't get the um, uh, the person that you know comes in and lays down. This is not a, a retirement plan for now. This is a consolidation of all of the superstars within a geographic area who have great practices, who love what they want to do, who want to continue to do it for a while. Uh, a while means that they commit to doing this for three more years or longer. So if they uh, want out within three years, then probably go ahead, take the money, and move on. If you can. Um, you know, if you don't mind someone else determining what happens to your staff and what happens to your practice and what happens to your patient, uh, you know, that's, that's just a choice that each individual has to make. And believe me, that is an easy one to make for somebody in that situation. We've seen it happen in medicine and pharmacy over the years. Uh, it's what I call JRC, justify, rationalize, and compromise. I've got to do this. I've got to take the money because it's in the best interest of my family. And then you go and buy a condo in Vero Beach or whatever is you know, <laughs> best for your family. But uh, uh, it's also what has led to the, uh, uh, the situation that we have in medicine now uh, as compared to what it used to look like. You know, medicine used to look very similar to what dentistry does now. You went and uh, picked out the dentist uh, or the uh, uh, physician uh Back then, through the yellow pages, they were all over the, every corner in town. And uh, you just ask your friends, hey, do you like Dr. Borders over here? Yeah, he's great. And you call and made an appointment. Now you don't do that. Uh, you pick an insurance company. Insurance pick, company picks a hospital. Hospital picks your doctors. And, you know, and same with pharmacy. You used to know who your pharmacist was. You could call them up. They'd meet you at the local drugstore uh, in the evening. Now you have no idea. You have to go through a phone tree at Walgreens or Rite Aid's or whatever right it to you know to get to whoever the pharmacist on duty is i just didn't spend 30 years of my life building something that uh, i care so deeply about uh to just turn it over for a check uh i, I just consider that uh, just a, for me it was just a uh, a negotiated terms of surrender uh to do that if i wasn't going to be able to determine what was going to happen with my patients with my practice and with my staff uh then um uh i, I couldn't live with that so, so let's talk a little bit about, you, you mentioned it earlier, you said that you had, initially you had 20 practices come together on the same day, right, to become part of this new model. And then I think it was a, a year later, there was another 37 practices that came together again. Um, so talk a little bit about the motivating factors there and um, just, just really interesting, you know, it's, it's, it's a, that's a big number, 20, 20 practices at once. Yeah. So, um, you know, that's what happened initially after I uh, had those conversations and keep in mind that all 92 of those locations. So the 20 practices and the 37 practices are 57 different brands. They still function under those brand names, uh, same people, same locations, uh, everything's exactly the same, same hours of operation. The, the public never even knew that this occurred because nothing changed. We basically stabilized the status quo. How it is now, what we did represented the least amount of change possible for each of those practices, including doing nothing at all. We built a wall of protection around ourselves uh, to really prevent uh, any DSO from gaining any traction in our market. We were able to, um, because of that tight density, uh, we were able to create the negotiating power in order to increase the profitability by millions of dollars in the first year. Uh, as far as I know, we were the only um, uh, practice of any type uh, where each of the partner doctors had their highest income year individually uh, in 2020 as compared to any other previous year, uh, even with uh, notwithstanding COVID. So uh, that was so successful <clears throat> in the early days of it uh, that uh, we, I started getting a lot of phone calls from the general dentist in the area. 
uh, enough so that I had a meeting with them, shared with them what we had done. They asked if we could do the same for them. And when I say, could we do the same, Pepper Point, uh, which had really started out as nothing more than a location, the back office support company for my original 20 orthodontic practices, now all of a sudden uh, is a DSO owned by 37 different doctors, the original um, partners within White Greer Maggard, plus all of those other 15 practices constituting the total 50 offices on ortho and pedo that all came together on that day uh, in August of 19. So uh, Pepper Point um, uh, then at that point um, uh, set up the exact same thing for the general dentist, uh, 37 different practices, 42 offices, 47 practice owners, and on October 1st of 2020, they form, formed their own independent company uh, that had all the same advantages, meaning no money changed hands whatsoever, uh, um, the income stayed the same and has increased uh, since that date uh, by about 12% over the over uh, previous year, um, and um, uh, they have the exact same um, uh, structure where they receive the passive income in retirement. They have the um, uh, stock that they sell uh, back to the overall company, which passes that ownership to the next generation of dentists, uh, allowing them to um, live out their hopes and dreams, just like our generation did. And um, so, yeah, over a 14 month period, those two companies formed, managed by Pepper Point, <clears throat> not owned by Pepper Point. Pepper Point simply facilitated the consolidation within this geographic area, all within 70 miles of Lexington, Kentucky, those two companies constituting 93 uh, total offices. So at that point, um, uh, it was uh, important that we uh, learn from what we did well, learn from what we didn't do well, uh, internally, go back and refine all of those systems within Pepper Point from uh, revenue cycle management uh, to how we uh, manage employee benefits uh, to how bills come in, how bill, how payments posted, all of those things, how uh, our procurement is done, renegotiated uh, uh, purchasing agreements at that time, uh, renegotiated agreements with third-party payers. Uh, in order to um, uh, really position ourselves well to go into other markets, should there be other people that want to fight for their own backyard through this consolidation model as an alternative to here's your check, here's your new income, and here's your stock certificates. So, so you mentioned, uh, you know, the original 20 and then uh, 37. And they, I think you mentioned that they were all original, they were pediatric uh, and or orthodontic practices, but you have some GPs as well, right? Yeah. So the original consolidation uh, was uh, GP, I'm sorry, was pedo and ortho. That was the th uh, 20 different practices, 50 total locations, 20 of those of which were the original White Brewer Maggard orthodontic offices. The second consolidation, which was a separate consolidation 14 months later, was all GP, 37 practices, 42 locations. Okay, gotcha. All right. So uh, let, let's talk a little bit about, you know, the type of dentist or, or the type of group that would this model would appeal to. Well, I think it really, you know, does appeal to uh, the dentist, the uh, orthodontist, pediatric dentist that enjoys what they do, enjoys what they're doing right now, uh, but wants true ownership. I'm not talking about true autonomy. There's a big difference in autonomy and ownership. When you talk about autonomy, most DSOs are talking about you have autonomy in making treatment decisions for a patient in the chair. What they don't talk about is the autonomy that occurs outside the chair, who you get your supplies from. Um, who works for you? How much do they get paid? Talking about the business side of things. That is where the autonomy stops generally in most of the um, DSOs that I've looked at, uh, how systems are put in place, that sort of thing. What we wanted to do was protect what we had. So all of those doctors that came in, those partner doctors in each of those two consolidations, they have board positions on not just the clinical boards, I'm talking about the boards that makes the decisions. Pepper Point simply does the legwork, determines what options are, presents pros and cons to that board, and that board of dentists makes the decisions 
about the business and where it goes forward. So that's a key uh, component, a key difference. In ours, they don't work for PepperPoint. They work for themselves. They work for their um, uh, group practice. Uh, they get determined when, to determine when they retire. They cannot get fired without cause. They cannot be replaced by somebody that gets paid less money. Uh, these folks are all making more money than they were made making when they were on their own. And the reason we can do that is because we don't have debt, because we didn't pay anybody anything, nor did we receive anything as White Group Maggard partners when this uh, consolidated. That money that these folks get paid in the t traditional DSOs, that money comes from a private equity fund, generally funded by either uh, wealthy families or, uh, in most cases, institutional investors. And there is an expectation of a 30% return in that. Well, how in the world can you pay a 30% return uh, to the investors if you don't take that away from the dentist? And in fact, you do take that away from the dentist and you take that away in terms of their compensation. That's what they're getting paid for, a multiple on the difference of what they used to make versus what they're going to make. So this model appeals to the people that aren't really interested in going to an associate level income after they've been receiving partner level income for 15, 20, 25, or 30 years. Yep. Great, great points. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about this. Earlier in the conversation, you had mentioned geographically that you were, your, your practices, the Pepper Point Partnership practices were 70 miles from like the center being Lexington, Kentucky. Is that, that about right? That is correct. Okay. So let's talk about the, the vi your vision for the future of Pepper Point. So um, what does that look like? Does it look like expansion from there or what are your thoughts? So the original intent uh, of this bill was really just to protect our own backyard, uh, protect what we liked, what we love to do for a living, and to make sure that we were continuing to get compensated for that. Um, to be able to uh, prepare for um, uh, the competition that, that inevitably comes into the market by way of uh, consolidation through a private equity backed DSO model. It's going to affect everyone unless self consolidation is done. Uh, after we did this, uh, I wanted to make sure that the concept was proven. And so we've had two years of one and almost one year of the other. It's working out exactly the way that we had uh, drawn it up. And um, so at that point, I decided, well, you know what, I might as well go ahead and share this with other folks to see if this resonates. And so I spoke at the Dykema conference out in Denver um, uh, last month, about five, six weeks ago, and um, it has absolutely resonated with folks. And um, so we've had calls from a lot of folks uh, in a lot of uh, different places throughout the country uh, wanting to hear more about it. We're sharing that with them, both in person and virtually. And um, so what we will do is um, uh, help execute the consolidation within the markets uh, of folks that want to protect what they built, that are like-minded with us, and that want to, to, to uh, uh, create this self-consolidation. Uh, and then the PepperPoint platform would, uh, uh, would be utilized in order to uh, manage all of the back office functions. So uh, in that regard, we're very similar to every other DSO in the services that we provide. We provide a very high level of services. Uh, as you can imagine, when these original partners are people that I've worked with uh, for 25 and 30 years, I make sure that they are served extremely well in all of those areas, HR, operations, finance, marketing. And um, so uh, we have gotten very good at that. So now uh, the idea is let's do that same thing to take away the night job from folks in other markets that want to self-consolidate, execute the, the uh, formation of the company for them, and then help them create the efficiencies as they identify to us what would be the best version of themselves. Remember, they keep their identity. Uh, that's important. They built themselves based upon their brand. They keep that brand. 
We simply want to help them do all of the things that they always wanted to do in those staff meetings when they would get together and say, we need to do this and this and this. And then after the staff meeting, everybody went back to their desk because there was nobody to execute those plans. That's what we help them do, become the best version of themselves. And as we do that, that does two things. It greatly enhances the patient experience, and then it creates increased profitability uh, as a result, uh, result, result of helping them um, uh, identify, document, and execute really efficient processes uh, within their offices as they want them done. We don't impose them. We simply help them if they want to become a better version of themselves as they define that. So after the Dykema meeting and people started to hear about this, this model that you've created, you've been talking, I guess, over uh, different parts of the country, uh, like-minded uh, groups or, or practitioners that might want to replicate something in their geography and, and leverage Pepper Points model. That's exactly right. And what I'm finding is there are a lot more people that are like-minded than I had anticipated. Uh, what they're telling me, Bill, is we didn't know there was anything out there like this. We thought we were going to have to sell our practices, take advantage of the high multiples now out of this fear of missing out. But we really don't want to take a cut in income. We don't want to retire in three to five years, or we don't want to work three to five years from now after we sell our stock uh, for a greatly reduced income. We just want protection. And so um, I've spent most of my time in airplanes flying into various markets right now uh, explaining this. Uh, we have not reached out to anyone ourselves. These are all inbound calls that we are simply responding to and uh, just identifying, hey, who really wants to do this? And, and letting them know you really don't have to do anything. All you have to do is be able to invite somebody to dinner uh, to um, to hear about it, and we'll show up and we'll explain this. And that has uh, uh, been extremely fruitful uh, in doing so. And I'm finding that there are a lot of people that are energized by what we're talking about uh, and, and our story and what we can show them uh, that we have done here and what they could do um, for themselves in their market. So before I forget this, Greg, what is your email address or an email address that they can contact if they if, if any of our listeners or the readers of Group Dentistry Now want to find out more and have you sit down and, and talk to them about this in, in more detail. Yes, they can uh, reach me directly at G White. So that's G as in Greg, white, like the color, at pepperpoint.com. So that's P-E-P-P-E-R. P-O-I-N-T-E. So there's an E on point on Pepper Point, and that's all one word, and that's .com. Excellent. That's great. And we'll make sure we have that email address in the show notes, and uh, we'll transcribe this entire conversation. So uh, the email address will be there as well. Okay. Final question for you. You know, uh, you're doing something pretty unique uh, in, in the industry and, and very unique in the DSO space. So based on what you're doing, and then what other DSO models look like and, and where the industry is headed. What do you think the future of dentistry looks like if you if we look out, I don't know, let's go five, 10 years out. What 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 would you see the landscape look like? Well, I certainly think that consolidation is going to continue to occur. Uh, it will be a nearly complete consolidation over the next 10 years in areas that are deemed desirable to live. Uh, as defined by the new graduates. Um, so I think the DSOs are paying careful attention to where uh, the graduating dental students want to live. That's where they're going in and, uh, uh, and consolidating these markets through the traditional DSO model, or in some cases, that's where uh, self-consolidation will take place uh, if what we have done resonates with folks. The places that will uh, be untouched largely will be the rural areas. Uh, that are three hours away from the nearest um, airport, one hour away from the nearest interstate. Uh, the problem with that is those individuals that have highly profitable practices in those areas are going to have it, uh, find it difficult to find people to come in and live in those areas to replace them. So they have something of very high value that is going to be very difficult to sell uh, for that reason. So the consolidation is going to occur. As that occurs, it's going to create limited options for the graduating dentists for ownership. Uh, it's going to put a ceiling on their 
level of income because they're not going to have ownership in it. Uh, it is going to um, likely result in the continued 30 to 35 percent turnover rate of doctors uh, that uh, currently exist within uh, the DSO space. And I think that is not going to bode well uh, for continuity of care for the patients ultimately. So um, what we try to do is just offer something a little bit different. Uh, obviously, it has resonated. If you can imagine um, uh, the, um, if you can imagine how compelling a model would have to be uh, to entice 38 partners, 20 different individual practices to all consolidate on the same day without receiving any money, and then one year later. 47 of them in 37 different practices consolidating all on one day without receiving one dime. Uh, the uh, details that I can't possibly get into here today are compelling enough to have made that happen twice, and it's resonating uh, with dozens of other uh, places throughout the country. So uh, consolidation will occur. It is up to the practitioners to decide what that consolidation would look like. Will it look like what medicine looked like? Will everyone sell to the large corporation and will all of medicine ultimately be, or, and will dentistry as medicine is today, all be owned by hospitals and corporations? Will dentistry be owned by corporations uh, backed by people who have never sat uh, and owned by people who have never sat in a dental chair? It will ultimately be up to the dentist, just as it was up to the physicians back then. Consolidation outside of doctor ownership cannot take place without complicity of the health care professionals themselves. That's a great way to sum things up and uh, exciting times for, for the industry and, and certainly exciting times for, for you, Dr. White. Uh, I'm really intrigued by the model and I'm excited for um, the future of the industry and the future uh, for the clinicians in particular uh, and ultimately the patients. Yes. I would just say to the dentist that the future of dentistry is 100% and completely within your hands for now. Uh, that is a great way to finish things off. So again, uh, we will have uh, Greg's email address if you want to reach out to him. Uh, Dr. White, I really appreciate you taking time today. Thanks for educating the Group Dentistry Now audience. Uh, this is uh, th this is a really intriguing model. It will be uh, We'll be following it uh, and we'll hope, hope to have you back next year. Maybe we can talk about the next uh, group that you've uh, worked with and, and, and where in the country that may, may be. Okay, I would appreciate the opportunity. I really thank you for having me on today, Bill. That sounds good. Again, that was Dr. Greg White, who is the president and CEO of Pepperpoint Partnerships. We'll have his contact information in the show notes. Uh, and thanks again, everybody, for listening in today. This is Bill Newman for the Group Dentistry Now Show. The Group Dentistry Now Show has listeners across North and South America, Europe, Asia, and Australia. If you like our show, subscribe today and please tell your colleagues about us.